I can go? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So welcome, everybody, to our last class. Let's go ahead and begin tonight, as always, uh, by bringing ourselves into the presence of our Lord, just closing our, our minds, our, our, excuse me, our, our eyes to let sort of all the worries and issues and activities of the day kind of fade away so we can place all of our attention, our heart, and our mind upon that of the indwelling spirit. We just rest there in that spirit for a moment. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we ask you to continue to grace us and bless us with an increased faith, a deeper hope, and a more fervent charity. We ask, Lord, that in each and every thought, word, and deed, you would conform us more and more into the image of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Spirit, help us, Lord, to be Christ to others and to experience your presence both in this world and in the perfection of the next. We ask all of this in the name of the same Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So because the directory is so huge and I already had the, um, the video presentation, I'm going to sort of reiterate some of the things from the video presentation that I think are the most um, important for you guys as far as in your in your coming ministry and so I want to focus sort of on the particulars and the rules so to speak the guidelines on things like the sacraments and such and I think a, a distinction you probably caught on to it enough uh, it was kind of came up enough is that the real distinction lies um, on uh, whether a community is considered to be a church or they're considered to be that other word, the ecclesial community. And so generally speaking, there are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, the acute ecclesial communities are the Protestant religions and faiths. And the church tends to be the Eastern ones. And remember, the distinction has to do with whether you have a val whether you have apostolic succession. So that's valid holy orders and therefore a valid Eucharist. Whereas the ecclesial communities uh, do not have um, the succession. And so therefore they're they're kind of placed in a really an entirely different sort of category. And so when it comes to these groups, as you, as you saw in the last week in, in your reading and in the video presentation, it's a lot easier, a lot different in terms of uh, interaction, sacramentally speaking and such, than it is with these groups. So we'll start though with baptism. Um, the directory itself lays out a lot of different things. It talks about uh, common prayer, it talks about non-sacramental liturgical worship, so involving yourself in things like liturgy of the hours, funeral services, different things like that. Um, common use of sacred places and objects, so if churches can share certain things among themselves. And then, um, of course, liturgical worship. And, and the uh, directory mainly focuses on three things in terms of liturgy, baptism, the Eucharist, and then marriage. And so those are the, the big three categories that kind of come up a lot. We'll start though by just kind of um, looking at prayer in common. So prayer in common isn't necessarily anything liturgical about it. Uh, it's just getting together and praying with other uh, Christians. Generally we're talking about in a formal type setting like the week of prayer for Christian unity or some special event a lot of times in normal years non-COVID years, there would normally be some Thanksgiving event, ecumenically, at least in this diocese, several different churches and such. Um, and when it comes to common prayer, the church is very clear that Catholics are encouraged to participate in that common prayer with other, um, other Christian groups and other Christian denominations and um, uh, uh, people. The specifics of common prayer from the Catholic point of view is that the primary focus of common prayer should be the unity among Christians. 
Having said that, we can also offer prayer together in other, situa other situations such as special uh, times of thanksgiving or intercession for our nation or for events that have occurred. But really, it's very important that we should be focused among, uh, on the idea of unity and where that fits in. And so the church has given four directives when it comes to these common prayer meetings. So when we get together and do common, when you actually, if you were doing something at your parish or asked to be involved in a larger diocesan event, these would be sort of the directives that you would have to sort of follow ahead of time as you're planning out the activities. And so the first one is it should, you should only choose readings from scripture, prayers and hymns, that manifest the faith or spiritual life shared by all the Christian people. So you wouldn't want to pick, uh, you know, if you're dealing, if you're having uh, something with the Baptists, let's say, you're not going to want to pick scriptures that <laughs> deal with like, um, you know, Jesus telling the apostles the ability for, to forgive sins, because clearly confession is not an aspect of the Baptist faith and belief. So that wouldn't be a unifying scripture. You're going to look for things that are um, ones that all the participants at that particular meeting hold in common. And it's at that meeting. You don't have to like do the general common denominator of every possible Christian. No, it's who are you actually doing this activity with, the prayer with. Um, second, whatever version of sacred scripture is used, it has to be agreed upon by all the parties involved. Usually this isn't a problem. Um, you may have seen from your reading or from my t the le video lecture, there's a lot of um, uh, ecumenical Bibles nowadays that were produced by Catholic and Protestant and Orthodox scholars all working together. So there's only a few times that this would be um, kind of an issue. But ones that generally would not be good to use from the Protestant side would be the King James Version. From the Catholic side would be the Dewey Reims Version. And then there's a few other ones that are still very confessional. That is, they're produced by only one type of Christianity, such as the most famous is the New International Version, the NIV. That one isn't good to use because the translation purposely changes words that would be appropriate to Catholics to other words. So, for example, when it translates the word in Greek, paradosis, for traditions, when it translates that in a positive way, when Jesus and Paul talk about translations good, they use the English word custom. But when they talk about uh, the same exact same Greek word in that translation, when they talk about um, bad you know, uh, tradition, like when Jesus cast against the Pharisees, then they use the term tradition. But what does that do? It's misleading, right? Because then tradition is always used in a negative sense it's clearly anti-Catholic. I mean, they don't say that out loud, but it is. So in general, though, most um, scripture, most types of scripture uh, variations will be fine. You just have to maybe do a little due diligence and make sure that that's okay. Uh, number three, whenever you're involved in common prayer, the, the structure of the celebration should take account of the different patterns of community prayer. So... You know, again, using the Baptists as a good example because they're so very different liturgically. Uh, when you're, if we're having a prayer service together, part of it might be very more structured along Catholic lines. There might be an antiphonal response psalm or something. But in the Baptist thing, it, it, it might be a little more freer and they would, they would sort of suggest their own guidelines for what that part of the celebration would be like. So you wanna make sure you incorporate as much as you can um, all the participating Christian churches sort of differences that they have uh, in community prayer, sort of their focuses. And uh, number four is really very, very specific. When services are arranged between Catholics and those of the Eastern Church, particular attention should be given to the liturgical discipline of each church. What that means, as I mentioned in the past, is we're kind of in an odd situation because Ever since the uh, end of Vatican II, literally the last day of Vatican II, December 7th, 1965, the, the ending celebration was the removal of the excommunications between the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church by Paul VI and Athenagoras I. However, in practice, it hasn't worked out that perfectly because 
from the Catholic side, as we'll see as we start to go through the sacraments, um, from our standpoint, the Orthodox can receive sacraments from us, and we could receive from them because of their apostolic succession, their belief, etc. For the most part, though, from the Orthodox side, it's not the same. They're more restricted. So that's what it's saying, that you have to respect each group's liturgical discipline. They would tend not to um, want Catholics to approach them and ask for uh, some of the sacraments that they can do so. So you always have to kind of be aware just of, of um, sort of the differences that still exist even between those churches in the East that are very close to us. There can still be uh, little, you know, so you might not want to do a, a, you might want, not want a Eucharist connected to that service or something like that if it ends up being problematic. Uh, as the, although it's not a, a quote uh, directive, nevertheless, they talk about the fact that when we have those celebrations, each churches, each community's uh, ecclesiastical leaders, their priests, their ministers, whatever, are, should be allowed to wear their appropriate dress, you know, their appropriate attire if they have special um, vestments, etc., things like that. Also, the church for the first time in Vatican II, although it's very common now, gave permission for those Catholics to go to non-Catholic churches in those celebrations. Uh, when we normally would do the, the holiday, the, um, normally there'd be an ecumenical service coming up in this diocese uh, during Thanksgiving, and there are multiple churches that are involved. Generally, the hosting church rotates. So it's a Catholic church one year, it's a Protestant church the next, and the same kind of group goes and moves along with it. Um, but again, you always have that ability that yes, we can go to their places when they're having these uh, ecumenical celebrations. Now, um, one thing that's very specific for us as Catholics though, is when you're planning or if something's in the works of planning and you hear about it, and it sounds like it's gonna be on a Sunday, you should try to move that date. Because for Catholics and Orthodox specifically, because of the um, reality of the, uh, the precept of the mass, holy, the holy day of obligation and mass attendance on Sundays, that can um, become an, a burden because the church is very clear. Look, going to these ecumenical services, going to a special mass for ecumenism does not replace the mass of the day. Therefore, you'd still be required to participate in the normal mass of that Sunday or Saturday evening. So the church just recommends, it's not required, but they recommend you think about that when you're planning events so that you don't cause sort of an undue burden to the Catholic and Orthodox participants to have to go to multiple you know, masses, things like that. Um, finally, when it came to this idea of common prayer, the church says that uh, beyond just common prayer, just getting together in prayer, that we can set up times of spiritual sharing. And they gave some examples. They said, we could have days of recollection. We're both Protestants and Catholics and Eastern Orthodox are all invited. Uh, we could have spiritual exercise programs. We might have a, a, a book study or a Bible study. And even something like a study of sharing traditions of spirituality and things like that. Uh, and the only thing to be aware of in those is we, you just have to still be very clear when we're presenting those things if there's real differences of doctrine that just need to be addressed so people don't get the wrong idea and understand what's kind of going on. Um, any questions on that so far? I mean, those, that's the kind of the basic, like, that's, us, that's really most of what we do in ecumenism to this day. Um, I sent out that very last handout that's very short, the four-page one. And as I mentioned, that's really been what we've done for the last 50 years. Most of our work has been just prayer together. And then there have been a lot of dialogues, but as I pointed out in that, in that paper, um, we've really not jumped the next hurdle. <laughs> it's taken, I mean, in a sense, like I said, we've become a victim of our own success because most Christian churches and communities do not look upon each other as you know, heretics or enemies or opponents anymore. They generally recognize each other's brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's wonderful. The problem is that's kind of caused, like I said, an indifference where there's no sort of movement to move beyond that just sort of, I don't want to call it superficial, but that first level 
of Christian uh, unity to really the deeper level of, but we still don't believe the same things. We still don't worship the same way. We still don't. So that's really the hurdle that we're, we're kind of at at this point. Um, and so we'll start looking at what the rules the church has so far for sort of drawing together closer in worship as we have at this time. And so we'll start with what's called, yeah. She had a question and then oh, I have a question. Oh, sure. So um, a few years ago, it seemed like, um, like at Easter and Christmas, um, in, or even at weddings, uh, um, people that weren't Catholic, um, it was some, something was written down or a priest would say something like, please join us if you, or don't join us if you're not. Do yeah, there should yeah there should be a little thing. It should be still in the back of most Catholic missals. Generally, um, usually it tells you who's invited to communion. Like it'll say for the yeah, oh, cause, yeah, cause I mean I don't priest. So at, you know, <laughs> at that point, can like so like if I had a Christian friend that came, they, they can't would, take communion. No, you, okay. even if the priest says so, don't. Th but that, how, they're they're weren't breaking you just the rules. That well, when you'll see the rules, they're gonna. When it comes to the Apply Eucharist, to it's gonna be very. People. It's gonna be different. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so they're really not invited because no. they don't understand and appreciate the fullness and the. Yeah, they're really not, and okay. and you know a lot of things have grown up in our faith. Um, for example, you know the people who go up like this. Yeah. That emerged in one ministry, marriage encounter, engaged encounter. Oh. So that at the mass, at the end of that week, weekend, that a non-Catholic partner could at least oh. go up with their yeah. spouse. They still were to receive communion, but they got that blessing. And then somehow over time, it kind of bled out to the normal Catholic community. And so now like kids who are Catholic, but not communion level yet go up. People who maybe just can't take communion because of whatever situation they're in as Catholics, and then even non-Catholics, um, it's fine. I mean, different priests like it or don't. Um, but again, it's one of those things that's kind of happened, but it's not liturgically like a, uh, it's not actually a, a guideline or a rule. I mean, if we train people so they know when you see these people coming up what to do and kind of give them a blessing and. Actually, we um, don't train them very well. Yeah. But well, it's really, problematic because, you know, you're given communion, and that's really the big thing. But it's very quick, you know, amen, amen, body of Christ, amen. And then someone comes up, and what was happening is these people were taking, like, 15 seconds to, you know, bless. And so it almost takes the focus away from the more important one, which is the Eucharist, to these non-Catholics or people who can't receive and what's happening to them. So now they basically say, you just say something like, God bless you, like really fast, yeah. so it keeps it moving. But there's also um, the problematic part that they're not an ordained minister doing the blessing right, mass. Right, right. Which, which is problematic. So that's why they're just supposed to say, God bless you, yeah. and not do some kind of formal sounding. I just yeah. say, peace be with you. Mm. Yeah, see, that would be great. <laughs> um, I, I, what I always, my hope would always be, especially at things where you, not necessarily at normal Sunday or Saturday evening mass, but my hope would always be is whether the, whoever the, the, any deacon or priest or even the bishops, when they're presiding at a service that they know there's going to be a lot of non-Catholics, weddings, funerals, RCIA, things like that, I think they always need to announce the rules right before communion. I mean, of course you do it kindly, you do it nice, but you need to let people know, <laughs> like, you know, those who are Catholic, and, you know, and, and, you know, we're sorry for those who can't, but until we share full communion, we pray for this, and what, however they want to do it. But I, I think it's very important um, because, yeah, it becomes very confusing. It, RCIA once, I remember one Easter vigil, I felt so bad, but uh, because I always tell the participants, I'm like, tell your family members this who are not Catholic, you know, let them know ahead of time. Don't let this walk into a surprise. And I don't know who they were connected to, one of the families, and they were sitting by themselves. It was a woman and a girl, probably about 13 or 14. And they went and they got communion, and I had come back. And I mean, obviously they weren't being malicious or anything. They were just holding it. They had no idea what to do with it. They were just holding it. And so I was really nice, but I, I tapped them and I said, you know, I'm all, 
I have to ask you to please consume those or I'm going to have to ask you to take them. And they looked at me like I was, you know, a weirdo. They're like, but they did, you know, but we shouldn't have to try to, we should try to avoid those awkward situations that make it a little worse than just having the priest or the minister say right at the beginning, here's what we need to do. So, um, so my question, you said we've yeah. kind of gotten we stalled as far as dialogue goes and, and not much more. Is that dialogue focusing more and more on uh, doctrine and theology? Because that seems to me those are the major hurdles to get unity closer and closer. We're doing you know, the prayer services and a lot of social justice stuff together. Um, and then you know, I look at it and go, okay, Catholics are asking us to become Catholic. Yeah. You know, in, in essence, you know, to become back into the church. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's where it should be. And at the highest level of dialogue, our really big ones are tend to be with the Orthodox churches, uh, the Anglican communion, it's called. Uh, at those levels, they're very, those documents and those, what those discussions are usually very doctrinal. Um, as I pointed out, in some ways, the problem has become the common Christian morality that all the churches and communities shared really till I would say 50 to 70 years ago has really collapsed in the last 70 years. I mean, the mainline Protestant churches, especially Anglican slash Episcopalians, they've just gone so opposite where we were when we first made our first connection with them back in 1967. You know, first um, married priest, then female priest, then gay priest, then gay marriage, then euthanasia. I mean, they everything that is come down like a stack of dominoes. And so it, it becomes harder and harder then to even get into the doctrinal issues because now we're so separated there. So like on the local level, at the high level, it's still pretty doctrinal. And also because um, that, that reality tends to be more American Episcopalian. Uh, you, if you were following the stuff a few years ago, you saw that... Um, uh, they have what's called the Lambeth Conference, which is kind of like a, our synod of bishops. Mm -hmm. And at the last Lambeth Conference two years ago, because there were so many problems in the American church of who they were allowing to be priests and bishops and such, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury disinvited the American Episcopalians. And so technically we weren't, as Catholics, we weren't supposed to still be dialogue with them because they no longer represented the Anglican communion. And it kind of, it kind of just, you know, passed over and we are again, but uh, there is a real problem. So it, the ecumenical world is all mixed up right now. <laughs> For example, generally, doctrinally speaking, we tend to be a lot closer to certain of these churches, you know, the mainline Protestant churches of the Reformation, Presbyterians, uh, Lutherans, Anglicans. Um, but morally now, we tend to be very different. And then when it comes to the opposite side, the evangelicals, doctrinally, we tend to be way apart, and yet morally, we, we're very close. So right now, it's kind of just an interesting thing of, of getting the evangelicals to like Catholics more in general, because we have the moral issues that kind of connect us. And on the other side, just trying to still maintain this relationship in this communion, even though from our standpoint, it looks like some of these churches are doing everything they can to kind of pull away from you know, historic Christianity, even in the broad sense, not even just as Catholic, but morally and, and what they yeah. do. So it's, it's become a real difficulty. But yeah, that's exactly, we need to move on and not just study the doctrine, but actually do something about it. You know, like I pointed out, we made that, that huge thing in 1999 or whatever with the, with the um, uh, Lutherans, the Joint Declaration on Justification. That's huge. That's what the Reformation was about. <laughs> and we ended up saying, oh, we pretty much believe the same thing. A lot of it was different emphasis and wording. And that's great, but it has led to absolutely nothing in terms of actually drawing closer and Lutherans becoming more into the Catholic Church or us, you know, sort of bringing them into the fold in some way. So it's really that deep, that level now that we're kind of at that we need to do something about uh, because that's what John Paul II warned about way back 25 years ago in Udunum Sint. He said, you know, now we need to really um, take these results and do something with them or else justice is what's happening. He says, or else we're going to see things starting to slip away. And that's 
what we're kind of starting to see now. But um, so the next thing is uh, non-sacramental worship. They talk about, and uh, this is on page 15 of last week's handout, and carrying over to 16. And again, there are four norms that uh, uh, deal with non-sacramental liturgical worship. Now, what does that mean? Well, common prayer is sort of anything, formal or informal, and it doesn't necessarily have to be led by the ordained ministers of any community, but liturgical worship, and this is the definition that the directory itself gives. Liturgical worship is that which is carried out according to the books, prescriptions, and customs of a church, so according to our rubrics, presided over by a minister or delegate. So it's in some way an official or at least quasi-official you know, celebration of that community. It's done according to how they would normally do worship services. The only difference between sacramental and non-sacramental is, is there a sacrament attached to it? Are we celebrating a baptism? Is there a Eucharistic liturgy? That would be sacramental liturgical worship. Anything else would be non-sacramental. So we're looking at non-sacramental right now. There's not a Eucharist. There's nothing like that. And so there are four guidelines for this one. It says, um, as far as Catholics, if we're at a liturgical celebration of another church, um, that the ch our church encourages us to take part in the things of that service, like the psalms, responses, hymns, and actions. Just like we would for non-Catholics here, right? We'd, at our church, we don't have kneelers, you know, but you would expect them to at least sit, if not kneel, when we're kneeling. You would expect some sign of peace, however they do it, you know. They would still sort of, whatever they can do, they should do, and so the same goes for us. When we're there, we should respect those parts of the service that we can take part in, um, singing the hymns, things like that. In fact, that last line is important. It's funny how I love these documents that are super strict rules, and then at the end they give you such an open-ended rule that you're like, okay, it would be nice to have a little more understand. But it says, if invited by their host, you may teach a lesson or preach. Okay, you know, so just whatever. But uh, the idea being that you can be invited to, you know, say something at, at, or preach at some of these events if asked to by whatever the hosting Christian community is. Uh, number two is really the same thing as that, but from the reverse side. Now, when they come to our churches, we're supposed to also um, treat them the same way. And also, it, re it reiterates that idea that we're allowed to wear, and we allow them to wear their proper uh, ecclesiastical you know, garments, appropriate to who they are. Bishops with their mitres and such. You could wear your, your stole. The priest could, you know, whatever that is that happens. Um, Number three, the funeral rites of the Catholic Church may be granted to members of a non-Catholic church or ecclesial community. Um, it's, that is, it, it doesn't say here that the bishop really needs to okay that, but the bishop sort of needs to okay that. When Brahm was bishop, there was a blanket okay. Um, I don't know if that's the case since, um, starting with uh, Bishop Cirilio Flores, who was very shortly the bishop, uh, and into uh, Bishop um, uh, Robert Today. I don't know if he's done that or if he requires a, a, uh, each time a new, a, a specific um, acceptance of that. But it is possible, it's not common, uh, but it is possible for funeral rites to be given to non-Catholic Christians. Um, this would not in any way apply um, to unbaptized infants of Catholics. Uh, that's automatic funeral rites. Even if they weren't baptized for whatever reason, the church law now is absolutely they are given Catholic funeral, Catholic funeral rites and such. So um, this has to do with you know, older members of, of these communities that aren't Catholic. So it is possible. Again, if, if that situation occurs, you better go to the pastor and make sure that the bishop has okayed that kind of thing for it because he still ultimately oversees it within this diocese. Uh, and you know he doesn't want to cause scandal. Who is the person? Why would they want Catholic funeral rites? Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons that go into it. 
And you, you are supposed to look in as much as possible if it was the person themselves desire or just those asking on their behalf. Like in other words, they're already deceased. Now the family comes because they're Catholic and maybe the family member wasn't. And they're like, oh, we want a Catholic funeral mass and everything. And you're like, well, did he want, <laughs> you know, obviously they can tell you whatever they want. But if you, if you kind of have an idea that this wasn't really the person's will, that goes into the decision too. And the bishop would look at that um, or the pastor, if the bishop has given is okay to those. Number four is similar, but instead of funeral rites, we're talking about blessings. Uh, like you had just mentioned, you know, the formal blessings. Blessings ordinarily given for the benefit of Catholics may also, also be given to other Christians who request them according to the nature and object of the blessing. And then it highlights what some of those are. Public prayer for other Christians living or dead and for the needs of intentions of other churches and ecclesial communities and their spiritual heads may be offered during litanies other invocations of a liturgical service, but not during the Eucharistic anaphora. So you could offer prayers for non-Catholics. This question does come up. Can masses be said for non-Catholics? Yes. Names of any non-Catholic person, though, cannot be said in that litany of saints and the people who we call upon because, because they're not in that level of communion. That's required a level of communion that's the Catholic Church. But as far as actually even in a mass, if you didn't know, you probably do. Yes, masses may be said for non-Catholics. The intentions can be for, they can bring up in the um, prayer of the faithful, you can mention things. Um, if something's going on with other uh, communities, we could pray, you know, when the Jewish shooting here happened last year, things like that. And they're not, that's not even Catholic or Christian, but you can bring those into the prayers, yes. So the diocese, our diocese, in the guidelines at the bottom of page 16 just kind of has the, just reiterates the same things. Um, it, and it's basically word for word because what you see in the box here is exactly just cut and pasted from the guidelines. So I didn't add anything. Um, so as far as funerals, you see the funeral rites of the Catholic church may be granted to baptized members of a non-Catholic church unless it is evidently contrary to their will and provided their own ministers unavailable. So that's one our church requires um, that's not necessarily part of the general guidelines um, so there needs to be a question asked of well okay they're baptists so why are you here is there a reason they couldn't be baptized in the ba in the baptist church or what's going on you know with, with what's happening there and then um, blessings now what's interesting is our church the we actually pulled from other areas of canon law and such to be more specific on the idea of blessings. So if you look at blessings on page 16 in the box, and it's in the handouts I gave you guys, blessings ordinary, so the first part follows exactly what the major directory says. Then it has that second sentence. It says, furthermore, catechumens who have celebrated the rite of acceptance may receive the ashes on Ash Wednesday. Now I think that's funny because I think in practice, everyone who comes to Ash Wednesday goes forward whether they're baptized or not, whether they're Catholic or not, and we just do it. But it's interesting to note that there actually is a, re is a rule of who can even receive ashes, technically. Um, and it's only Catholics. That's why they have to have passed, entered into the catechumenate formally, the rite of acceptance in RCIA. Up to that point, they're not considered part of the church, um, part of the Catholic church. The same goes for their feud for death. If, God forbid, you have someone going through RCIA and they die before RCIA ends and they did not, were not able to receive their sacraments, maybe at the hospital where the, your pastor could come and, and do those sacraments quickly, if they die without them, um, they're, they're still given a Christian funeral. There's still all those things go into effect because baptism of desire kicks in at that point. And so there's no question about that. So the same, once they pass that rite of acceptance, they are now, quote, members of the church in some form that we don't define except that they can get those. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yes. And there are still guidelines that they have to have for that to occur. Um, and we're, we're, uh, let's actually look at that right now. If we jump ahead in, our, in the um, handout, 
Go to page 21, which are the three sacramental issues, baptism, Eucharist, and matrimony. So when it comes to baptism, uh, as you've seen, I'm, as I've kind of repeated over and over, because it's kind of the mantra of the documents, um, baptism is kind of our common core of how we are define ourselves as Christians. And so all baptism that uses water and the Trinitarian formula believed in faith is an authentic baptism that incorporates a person into Christ and his church. Now, without getting too specific, you have to be careful, and that's why um, at the diocese, and you should have copies at your parish in the diocesan policies, I think, book. If not, you can get one from the diocese. You should have a list of the churches locally and groups whose baptisms are, quote, valid. Now, if they're not on the list, it doesn't mean they're not valid. You just have to do a little investigation at that point. We're talking mostly about people in RCIA who are coming in. But simply using water and saying the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not itself proof that it's valid because that's what Mormons do. They use that formula. But we do not accept their baptism as valid because their faith in what the Trinity is and who Jesus is, is not ours. And so, yeah, that wouldn't be a situation you run into a lot, but know that like the Mormon baptism is, is you don't even have to worry about that one. That's, they have to be rebaptized. Um, but generally speaking, if they use water and they use the Trinitarian formula and they actually believe in the historical meaning of Jesus, the incarnate Christ and the Trinity, then you're good. And so the church very much encourages each diocese um, and parish even, to really, you know, start to enter into a common agreement, find out which churches around the area, kind of get an idea of what they believe about baptism, how they baptize. Now, whether a church baptizes by immersion or pouring are equally valid as far as the Catholic Church is concerned. Other churches may not accept that. They may have to do full immersion or something like that. So just realize, you know, you so, so that doesn't affect us for RCIA, but just know when you're talking to other Christians, that might be a, an issue that comes up. We are to presume validity unless some serious doubt exists. Sometimes that would emerge from the person himself. You know, you're like, <laughs> uh, they're like, I don't have a baptismal certificate because our church did it on the beach in Solana, you know, on one weekend, and we don't keep records of that. Okay. And so you ask the person, well, what did they say? What did they do? And if it, sometimes the personal offer, like we had one last year who was like, I don't remember like what the baptism was. He says it was kind of terrifying. Like it was in a youth group. They basically told everyone who wasn't baptized they were going to hell. He was so terrified he couldn't remember what was said, if he said yes to me. So we don't like to, but in a situation like that, and then we, on top of that, we couldn't get an affidavit. There was no one else who had witnessed that baptism who was alive or who was present. Um, the church itself wasn't it wasn't a church it was some parachurch group in his case we rebaptized him conditionally just because we weren't sure so sometimes as people are coming into RCA they kind of give it away for you and they they're the one who you start okay I'm, I wonder about that uh, also just like for Catholic sacraments the minister's insufficiency of faith does not validate their baptism so the minister might turn out to be a real scumbag later who baptized them, and they might bring that up. That is not a cause for rebaptism or doubting their valid baptism. The baptism itself is valid. It's done with water in the Trinitarian formula, meaning the real Trinity as we understand it with that intent, whether the person themselves ministering it uh, believed it or not. So that is not an issue, just as it isn't in Catholic uh, sacraments, because that comes up too. Right. Um, all even more so now because of all the priest scandals and such of the last decade. Um, but even before that, every once in a while, I'd get a call and someone would want to change their kids. Godparents. Right. Can I change my children's godparents? Because these two don't even go to church or anything. And, you, and you're like, no, you can't do that. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can have people who are probably going to be more influential in their spiritual life now. And that's a good thing but we can't do it, you know? Or I just found out the priest I did has been, who baptized me or my child, he's just been um, removed from orders because he was found 
to, to truly be criminally you know, guilty of some of these um, actions. Is my baptism valid? Yeah, it's still valid. So sometimes there's a question, um, even among Catholics and their sacraments, but the, the minister's faith or actions do not invalidate the baptism itself. Um, a couple of things to be aware of, though. Even though baptism is our common unifier, because we are baptized into a specific community, you may not have two ministers of two different groups baptize at a celebration. Right? You can't do that. So there can't be like a, a, the priest and then, or you, and then they have like the minister from the downtown church that one of the family went to or as a family member. Okay, it has to be only one of the churches can do that. Similarly, um, now, now, the minister of the other church, just as in a wedding, can be asked to participate in one of the like outer line things. Like, they can say a blessing or a prayer or a reading, but they cannot be the one to confer baptism because if they do that, then that child belongs to their faith community. That's the one they were just baptized in. Now, when it comes to godparents, and here's where we see a little distinction now. Um, when it comes to godparents, from the Catholic point of view, the godparents must be of the same Christian community in which a baptism is being celebrated because they represent that body. Um, so what that means for a Catholic baptism. For a Catholic baptism, here are your choices. If you have two godparents, you don't have to, but if you have two godparents, both must be Catholic. And both must be, at least in so far as we can tell, practicing fully initiated Catholics. Now, practicing is generally discovered by what? You make them bring a letter from their church. You know, you have no idea what that means, but at least they're on someone's records in a church somewhere that they're there. They themselves have to have been baptized, confirmed, and Eucharized, first communion in the church. Now, they do not have to be married to each other, but if they are married, or even one of them is, that marriage must also be sacramentally valid or they cannot be a godparent for Catholics. So uh, that's important as well to recognize, and that's one that kind of sometimes becomes a little bit of a sticking point, you know. Um, so that's the first choice, two Catholics. Or you may have a Catholic and an Eastern Church member and that person is a godparent. Be their name goes in the register. They're a godparent. Why? Because they are valid churches. Similarly, you, if asked to go to an Eastern church, may be a godparent there. Well, they accept it on their own. If they accept it, right. Um, now, if it is a Protestant, and I just use that term because that's most of these groups are Protestant, then that person can be there but they are not a godparent, they are a Christian witness. And they can still only be there if there is at least one Catholic godparent. They can't be the only person. And so their name is not official. It does not go necessarily in the baptismal record. It can, and most churches will put a name there, but it's, I don't wanna say it's irrelevant, that makes it sound bad, but they, they don't, their, their presence doesn't do anything more or less to the baptism. Did you, were you gonna, someone said, but it's irrelevant. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know. Well, it's kind of like in the same way within the Catholic Church, you know, there, uh, some of our cultures have huge numbers of godparents yeah. or Patrons, different things. Sponsors. But even with all that, under canon law, only one is the primaries, right? My wife and I are secondary and tertiary godparents. So I don't know how many people I still trying to be number one, right? I want to be the primary godparents. Maybe someday. But anyway, so that's a similar thing, right? In canon law, that's, it's still only those two are the ones of record, per se. Um, so that, that's a difference. Now, um, what, about, what about if you're asked to be a godparent at a, not an Eastern church, but at a, Protestant church. You should decline. You should decline. You might ask exactly what the, like, the if they have a similar situation to like we have, that is, if you can be there just as a 
participant, like their equivalent of the Christian witness, that would be all right. But you really cannot be a godparent. Why? Because you, you're not a member of that community. You can't stand up for that community. You don't support, per se, that specific church, that group. You're really not supposed to be one. So um, the answer generally is no. And I know that's difficult sometimes in family situations. So you, try, you can try to ease it however you need to. You, know, you can still be present there. You can, but maybe don't have to say any of the vows or whatever it is that the godparents would, would do themselves. Um, now, another thing. Now, an Eastern Christian comes and they want to be Catholic. They come to RCIA. I actually have an easy slam dunk here. <laughs> if they're baptized, you can ask, and even if there's no record, if they answer yes or someone can answer yes that would know, it is presumed that they were also confirmed because the Eastern churches confirm when you're baptized. If that's so, that confirmation is valid. All those people have to do, they do not have to go through RCIA if they don't want to. I would still recommend it, it'd be nice, but they're not required to. All that's required of them is a profession of faith and they're Catholic because all their sacraments are valid. Now, when it comes to um, any other churches, any other groups or churches that aren't the Eastern churches, Lutherans, uh, Anglicans, Episcopalians, I don't think there's many more that do confirmation. There might be a few, maybe Presbyterians, I can't recall. Any of those other, quote, confirmations are not valid in the Catholic Church. So any of those people must receive Catholic confirmation at the Easter Vigil before they be allowed to take um, the Eucharist. So very different situations when it comes to baptism slash confirmation for the two churches. So let's... Um, I got a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. I actually got a couple, but one's going back. But, um, the first one is, is we, uh, a couple years ago, we had a, uh, a gentleman go through the program with us that was the Anglican Rite. Okay. Oh, Angl okay. Anglican Rite. Yes. Yeah. And um, what would have happened to them when, they, when that whole rite came into the church? How would that have, you know, that would have gone down, so to speak? Yeah, that's, that's a special, <laughs> that's a whole special thing because that was created by, papal fiat and papal apostolic letter. Mm -hmm. And so um, as far as the average uh, parishioner who came over in those groups, we're talking about when the, the big, uh, when the Anglican churches were given that kind of open door to enter the Catholic church because of the problems they've been having. Um, th there were three in San Diego, if I recall. Um, when it came to the pew, the, the average people, I think they were sort of grandfathered in. It was just accepted. They did a profession of faith, um, and that was fine. For the ministers, th they had to go through an extensive process, and I want to say two out of five weren't allowed in um, for various reasons. And they did have to go through a whole other retraining. And so there was kind of an interim process that just ended actually recently where um, they were the the heads of their communities, but there was usually a, a Catholic priest sort of assigned as sort of a watchdog for everything until they were, quote, formally ordained in that ministry. Now, they, now they've been around long enough. They, they have a, um, a, a vicariate. They have a whole thing that governs the whole United States. Um, I know there's still problems. I know up in, I have a friend who goes to one of those, one of the Anglican um, right up in Temecula slash area, somewhere up there. And I know they're having issues between <laughs> their group, which is not just Angli Anglican, quote, Catholics, but also extremely conservative, almost to the point of traditionalist. And I know that's becoming a problem with the bishop up there and, and how that's working out. So yeah, it, uh, that's a whole different situation. Um, and actually, John Paul II had allowed it earlier, but he didn't allow whole communities. But he allowed the ministers to come over and remain, not have, you know, they didn't, they, if they were married, they could still become a, a priest. Um, the Catholic Answers, one of my teachers in college, at 93, was Father Ray Ryland. He was a married, you know, Catholic priest. So, um, yeah, this was a whole new thing with Benedict to really allow multiple uh, communities that if they made that profession of faith. Uh, and also I think 
But the thing to recall is it's also because it's the Anglicans, and the Anglicans are kind of an odd duck because they're not, their holy orders are in, que or are in question, not necessarily invalid, because there was a mixture from the real bishops who all were Catholic bishops and became Anglican at their roots, and then the ones that were later appointed by the crown. And how do you kind of dilute all that? And so in the large scheme of things in dealing with the Anglicans, the Catholic Church says, well, we don't consider them to be a church. But then if we want to, we can kind of say, well, they're sort of probably a church. At least some of those people are validly ordained. So I think there's kind of a, a little play there that they use that wouldn't be the case if it was like Lutherans or something else. That would have to be a whole different situation that would happen at that point. Um, Okay, so let's, let's look at the Eucharist. And here's where you also see the huge difference between the two churches. Um, when it comes to the Eastern churches, even those not in full communion, because they have apostolic succession, because they have a true priesthood and a true Eucharist, we can um, celebrate, at least from the Catholic point of view, uh, the Eucharist validly with them. And so on page 19, you have the five norms. These norms only apply to the Eastern Church, okay? not to any other churches. We have to be very specific about this. I'll read the actual norm. I, I, I just wrote it in kind of plain language here, but the actual norm says, it is lawful for any Catholic for whom it is physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister to receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick from a minister of an Eastern church, if necessity or a genuine spiritual advantage. Page 25. Yeah, sorry, page 25. Takes place. So a very specific um, rule given there. Now, let's see if I can find... I wanted to see them. If you, um, if you go to page 27, for this one it may be better to actually look at our guidelines in the box. You'll notice Eastern Christians. Here are the specifics for the Eucharist. And it starts out just like it usually does with what the actual directory says, but then it specifies it. It says, it is lawful for any Catholic to receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick from a minister of an Eastern church whenever a spiritual advantage exists. Now notice, in our diocese, it does not require moral or physical necessity. In other words, they don't have to prove that for a moral or physical reason they couldn't get to a Catholic minister. Our, our diocese has chosen to take a more lenient view. If there's a spiritual advantage and they want it from an Eastern church, that's good enough. And notice it doesn't define spiritual advantage. That's when you're saying Eastern the Church, person. you're talking about Orthodox, not Eastern. Right, Orthodox. not Eastern Catholics. Catholic, a Catholic Church, Eastern Catholic, you can go to any time you want, fulfill your requirement, etc. Because I had a priest that was a little perturbed that his God kids had raised up and decided to start going to visit you, right? Mm -hmm. David uh, Hess, who's the deacon, uh, who was the deacon there, he started as a deacon here in the Roman Rite and then moved over um, to their right. And so the bishops okay the, are supposed to okay those things and such if you really do it as a formal thing. If you just go there, that's fine. Um, similarly, Catholic ministers may lawfully administer the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, anointed the sick to members of the Eastern churches who asked for the sacraments and are disposed. Now, it points out, though, however, many Eastern churches would not allow their faithful to. Now, it's not up to you to decide if this will cause them a problem or not, but what you do want to, in, you do want to avoid anything that looks like proselytism, like you're trying to, quote, make them Catholic. So if a situation like this arises, generally it's, it's you know, the three sacraments mentioned are ones that only priests and bishops can do. But if it comes before you, um, the, the pastor needs to be really sensitive about this. The person's asking for it, so according to canon law, he can be given them, he or she can be given them. At the same time, if this becomes a common occurrence, if, um, 
you know, he, the pastor needs to kind of talk to this person and find out what's going on because it could become really uh, ugly if we're constantly giving this guy communion. He's not going to his church, but he could, but we don't, and he's just choosing not to, but he's still Eastern Orthodox. Uh, it's just something you have to kind of approach a little carefully. And then it says, Catholics may receive the sacraments from the ministers of Eastern Catholic churches that are in communion with Rome. And we have a listing of those in the, Di in the Dawson directory. Um, although technically under canon law, as we'll see, we can receive from Eastern Christians who are not in communion. The reason why our diocese just only stated that fact is, is because we know the fact that they don't want us to have communion in their churches. And therefore, from our point of view, we're not going to give our people permission to like go forth and go try to do that. Um, you know, even within churches that are Catholic, are, that are Eastern, there's a problem. Uh, the Byzantine Catholic Church, Holy Angels here, um, and I knew Father Mel before, and I know the new the pastor since. Um, sometimes they have an issue because, and this comes up in the directory as well, is sometimes Catholics, Roman Catholics are drawn to them because they, uh, they look at them and think of them as more, quote, traditional or conservative. So they're going there for sort of their own motives, and then what often happens is they don't obey the rules of that church. So, for example, Eastern Christians almost never kneel. Most of their churches don't have kneelers. It's not part of their thing. Standing is the sign of respect and of prayer in the East, right? Jews pray standing to this day. The Eastern churches from that culture and time pray standing. And so, you know, during the Eucharist, all of a sudden, like, you have, like, 20 people kneeling. And the pastors get really upset because it's, you know, it's, you've got now a crowd of Romans all block, coming in and doing their own thing at the church. So we're always to respect the rules of the church we're in as well. They're disciplined when we go there. Okay, so now let's look at um, Eucharist with the Protestant community so, and to answer your question that comes up here. Um, at the bottom of page 25 on the last week's handout, I have... The very bottom you have the indented paragraph that comes from the directory itself. And this kind of sets the stage that it's very different when we're dealing with Protestant churches than when we're dealing with the Eastern churches. Um, in general, the Catholic ch Church permits access to its Eucharistic communion and to the sacraments of penance and anointing of the sick only to those who share its oneness in faith, worship, and ecclesial life. For the same reasons, it also recognizes in certain circumstances, by way of exception, and under certain conditions, access to these sacraments may be permitted or even commended for Christians of other churches and ecclesial communities. So what are the certain circumstances and certain conditions the church is talking about? And it lists them later. Remember, this is only to do with Protestants, not with Eastern churches. They do not have to meet these requirements. There, the directory is clear that there are four requirements that must be met. That means all four. It is all or nothing. If you don't, if the person does not meet all four requirements, they may not receive those sacraments. So it's, it has to be all four. What are they? One, the person must be unable to have recourse to the sacrament desired from a minister of his, his or her own church. Number two, they must themselves ask for the sacrament of their own initiative. That one come, can be dicey. Generally speaking, though, if the person's in a coma and they ask you for it or, you know, they're, they're unable to speak, um, if they're not the one asking, you're not to give it. Number three, the person must manifest Catholic faith in the sacrament. Generally speaking, it's presumed you can ask them something like, do you believe this is really Christ's body and blood? Do you believe, you know... You're truly forgiven your sins. Just a one-liner by the priest will usually suffice. And the person must be properly disposed. That is, they have to be in whatever state a Catholic would be in, so not in a state of grave sin to receive the Eucharist, um, things like that. Now, uh, let's, uh, before we move on to Catholics in the same situation, when it comes to uh, danger of death, here's... yeah. So when you say they can't be in a uh, mortal, what did you say? They can't a state of grave sin. So what, I mean, 
do the Christians believe too that there's mortal sin and venial sin? It depends on the Christian group. It would be from the Catholic standpoint. That person, therefore, would have to receive the sac. If if they can receive sacraments, they would have to receive the sacrament of the the penance before they could be given the Eucharist or anointing of the sick. Oh, okay, okay. That's what it. That's what it means. Okay, like in that case. So you couldn't Thank do you. anointing of the sick, sick which includes a, a sacrament. As, yeah, as long as the sacrament, as long as that sacrament comes in, where you have that, that takes care of it for the Eucharistic uh, reception at, at the part of it. When it comes to a, a Protestant who's in danger of death, the rule is two things: they still have to meet all four requirements, even if they're in danger of death. Now, in some ways, the requirements are more easily met. For example, if you're the person there as a Catholic minister, and their minister cannot get there in time because they're at the moment of death, well, that already takes care of number one, right? So it is easier to fulfill the requirements in some sense, but they are still required to have all four. And the bishop, the ordinary, must have approved it. Generally, the bishop does so blanket statement for the diocese, and I believe we do have one. I don't know for certain, again, Whenever we change bishops, it, it depends on the new bishop. Generally speaking, there's um, some that, that there has to be some uh, guidance by the ordinary. In the um, on page 27, where our guidelines are, they just simply they they state it as sort of five, actually kind of six rules. It says Catholic ministers may administer the sacraments to a baptized person, not who's of the Eastern, with the following conditions are present in danger of, notice they say, in danger of death, unable to receive, ask for it of his own initiative, manifest Catholic faith. Now, the fact that we made in danger of death one of the requirements, what does that tell you? No Protestant could receive the Eucharist or those other two sacraments any other time in our diocese from a Catholic minister. In fact, we only allow it to non-Eastern Christians at danger of death in this diocese. So no weddings, so when no they RCA. Do that weddings, I've, I've, I've known it's happened in yeah. multiple weddings. That, yeah. That priest yeah. is not. It, it happens, the priest is not obeying the rules of the bishop, yeah. So in our diocese, we're, it's very uh, clear of where that is. Um, so that kind of, does that, that sort of answers the question for what we're supposed to do? Now, if your pastor's doing it, I leave that up to you how you decide, so I'm not going to say anything there, but <laughs> we might be looking for a new church soon afterwards, right? That happened to me a few years ago, and I felt really bad, but I'm really good friends with the deacon. And I won't say names or churches, but when Prop 8 was going out, um, if you recall, and the Catholic Church was really on fire to help make sure that that passed, the traditional marriage one, uh, and so... Bishop Brom decreed that every church had to put out signs and different things. And there was a church in North County that wasn't. The pastor simply refused. And so the deacon who was at my Bible study came to me one day and he's like, well, he's not doing it and I don't know what to do and parishioners are asking and there's issues. And he said, what do you think? And I said, and I should have just said, we'll do whatever you want. But I'm like, well, I, I said, technically you don't answer to your pastor primarily your your orders are given to the bishop i'm also tell the bishop and he did and so that church had signs up the very next week but a few months later he was at another parish because just couldn't work so i'm not giving advice anymore to any of you guys you just figure that out how you want to deal with that but at least you know what i would always do is you can always approach it just let them know and then whatever they do with it now it's their problem not yours. You, you've done what you were supposed to do, and then you just kind of let it go. Um, so other things that, what if a Catholic finds themselves in the same circumstances? In other words, what if you're in a place, not necessarily in danger of death, but what if, what if you find yourself unable to, you know, um, receive the sacraments, there's no Catholic church around, there's nothing like that. The rule for us is much more restrictive as well. A Catholic has to also, we have to meet the four requirements ourselves. So there can't be a Catholic minister around um, who can give it to us. We have to 
uh, ask for it ourselves. We have to have the faith in the sacrament and be disposed. So what does that mean in practical terms? The directory is very clear. It says we can Catholics can receive those sacraments only from a minister whose church we see these sacraments are valid, who is known to be validly ordained according to the Catholic teaching on ordination. What does that mean? We can only receive from Eastern churches, period. That's the only people we can receive from. Even in danger of death, we're not to receive from Protestants um, because of uh, the difference in the Eucharist and everything else. So that's kind of the norm on that. So as you can see, you know, this is like the big dividing line is the, the whole apostolic succession. If your church possesses it, then the rules are very different and we're so much more similar and closer than when if you don't possess it and then we have um, a lot of issues. The problem is, is so many communities make up these groups that within this huge cluster, there are a few that are churches but I don't want to confuse you guys, and because they're so few and far between, and almost none of them exist in the United States, they're all European in origin in there, um, I don't really mention it. One that you may come into contact with is a group called the Old Catholics, Old Catholic Church. They are a group that split after the First Vatican Council. Um, they refer to themselves as the Old Catholics, and but it's only the ones of a certain, like, group of them that we accept as a legitimate church but like i said that just starts getting us way too more technical than you need to worry about the um but generally speaking when it comes to the protestant communities uh, the what we can do is a lot more restrictive because of our completely difference of belief in ordination generally in the eucharist often um, in apostolic succession all those kind of things now when we're talking about the Eucharistic liturgy, a mass or even just some celebration where the Eucharistic, a Eucharistic liturgy, like um, you know, First Fridays, if you have Eucharistic adoration, if you have benediction, any of those are, quote, Eucharistic. In those cases, homilies may only be given by Catholic clergy, period. Um, similarly, uh, other people can take part in singing psalms, responses, hymns, etc., outside of the Eucharistic liturgy. But if we're talking about a Mass now or Eucharistic thing, everything really has to be Catholic, except in the most extreme circumstances, which only the pastor or the bishop can okay. That means, you know, the homily has to always be given by the Catholic deacon or priest. The readers have to be Catholics. Um, Sometimes exceptions are made at funerals, but even at funerals, we generally are trying to have the family members who are Catholic read, even if they're not, quote, lectors normally. Uh, so when, once the Eucharist comes into play, it sort of becomes much more re restrictive. Now we're looking at pretty much only Catholics. And if, the, if it arises, then these uh, members of these churches, if they want to and if they're allowed to, can take place in some of those things too. Anything you guys have? Okay. All right. Let's look at marriage then. Last one. Marriage. As if we don't already have enough rules on marriage, right? You probably had to have, a, I'm sure you had to have a marriage class, right? Because canon law is like, like half the books on marriage. So I'm a real, I'm a, not a real, I'm a regular attorney, not a canon attorney. But I remember years ago, they needed more people to read the cases for the tribunal. So they put like a, a, a call out, you know, if you, have, if you have understanding of law and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at the cases in the law and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> Canon law is so like, so many ins and outs of marriage. I'm like, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. If a Eucharist is involved, they're supposed to be. Uh, like I said, funerals, there'll sometimes be an exception made. Um, and if it's a funeral service, but not necessarily attached to a mass, if you're just doing this, then a, then a non-Catholic can read and do things. If it's a mass, it really should be Catholics. A an easy way for your um, bereavement group or whoever puts funerals together may just 
make it easy for everyone and say we have lectors read that, you know. But if you have a family member who's Catholic who wants to, they can read if, if they wish. Uh, and you can always sort of give it to them as an option. Like you have someone you don't have to worry about doing that. Um, yeah, funerals, uh, there's so much stuff about that you guys need to, <laughs> need to deal with too that go way beyond ecumenism of like, you know, how, can, how long can a eulogy be? Who, where can it be at? What can you do? So, um, but generally speaking, if a Eucharist involved, generally speaking, it has to be Catholic. Uh, and in, more, in certain situations, the Eastern churches. Um, if there's not a Eucharist involved, then those secondary kind of actions, readings, psalms, things like that, um, even a prayer can possibly be done by, by a non-Catholic Christian. I, I think only the I think it's I think that choice is up is is left to the pastor can do it and he has certain requirements he has that he can do it under so it's it's one of those norms that usually no but there are exceptions which only certain people can decide if that except usually the pastor can decide or not um, similar one thing would be obvious though and that is if the person isn't Christian at all, if we're talking about a non-baptized person, I mean, now we're outside of ecumenism, that person shouldn't have any role whatsoever at any role in the church. Technically, even ushers, even though all you're doing is showing people to their seats and helping get communion. Um, the real rules for it is all those people should be fully initiated Catholics. Like, your lectors should be confirmed, even though a lot of adults aren't necessarily. Even the ushers should be all those ministries, you know, and sometimes that's a good sort of catechetical time is to go to the different ministries and, you know, who never got confirmed and maybe we can do this in an easier setting with you guys because you're always, you're obviously practicing Catholics and such. But uh, when it comes to that, then no. But anything like that in a funeral situation, you'd want to put at a different place after the little, after the, um, maybe between the mass and the internment, internment, uh, you know, or if they have the celebration afterwards and they come and do, you know, watch a video and then anybody can say any eulogy they want. At that point, it's, you're just sort of hosting the, the program. But when it's in the liturgical setting, it really has to be Catholic. Okay. Um, let's see. Matrimony, there's so much on. I really just want to mention a couple things. Um, one is the term mixed marriage. It sounds so weird. <laughs> it just sounds almost pejorative, but it's not. It's simply the technical term in canon law for any marriage between two Christians, one of whom is not Catholic. So a mixed marriage are both Christians, though. It's not like a non-sacramental marriage where one of the two is not baptized at all. Um, and a mixed marriage, every single one of them has to go to the bishop for permission for it to be done. There is no, I mean, it's universal in the sense that the bishop's usually going to just rubber stamp it, generally speaking, but you still have to make the effort to actually, it has to be applied to him. The pastor cannot make that decision. It has to go to the bishop. So the bishop has to be the one who okays, in theory, every mixed marriage that occurs. And so if you have people in marital groups or you know about them planning for marriage and you know their situation... <laughs> you might let them know ahead of time, right? Because they want to get all that stuff in line before they start going through their wedding preparation and all that kind of stuff, the knowing that they're going to have to. someone to do that for him? Usually he delegates. And like I said, usually it's kind of a, unless the pastor sees any issues, why the bishop should look at it more closely. Generally speaking, the bishops are okay with it, um, especially if it's uh, churches that we have a lot of longstanding sort of relationships with. But still under canon law, only the bishop, only the ordinary can make that decision for every single mixed marriage. Because he has to dispense the Catholic a lot of times from, it's, mo it's mostly for our side. The bishop has to dispense you from the normal uh, Catholic marriage requirements in some sense. Um, now, if it's being done in your church, if, if the marriage is being done in the Catholic church, and it is going under, it, it is being done according to the Catholic uh, marriage, uh, the, the rubrics, th then it's pretty much the bishop's just okay. <laughs> but what it's, we're going outside and, and our Catholic person is getting married in another ceremony, you know, a non-Catholic Christian ceremony somewhere else, 
then that's when the bishop needs to look at it more closely and say, oh, okay, yes or no, because he has to dispense us specifically from that, uh, our form, our normal form. Yeah. Uh, a sa well, a sacrament between two baptized people, yes. If if one of the two, even if it occurs in the Catholic Church, if one of the two require, if one of the two participants, one of the spouses is not Catholic, then you might have gone through the Catholic rite, even had a communion service and everything. Technically, it's it's not a full sac. It can't be because the one's not even baptized, so there's no bond that the sacrament can can attach to. Yeah. A lot of times that's a lot of times that happens because the Catholic partner still needs to make sure that from their side they have to be married in the because uh, that would be I mean because I I'm sure there's a situation but that would be asking the opposite would be almost I couldn't imagine most bishops even liberal ones saying um, well I'm going to be married in, to this non non Christian in an entirely non Christian ceremony well then all of a sudden the bishop's going to be like nah, you know, hold on. So, um, does that happen that often? Because it seemed to me that a person that doesn't care if they're married in the Catholic Church or not wouldn't go to get married. Yeah, that's why I don't think, that's why I said I couldn't even think of a situation yeah. that would probably happen at. And the, but it still makes it a valid marriage. It's still a valid marriage. In, in, in the sense that if the marriage is dissolved. Uh, yes. And, and now here you're moving. <laughs> in the canon law? Yeah. And, and at that point, I, I'm a, like I said, I'm a regular attorney, canon law, and especially with marriage, I'm just like, wow. Um, yes, but I still think if that marriage were dissolved, I still think the process for nullity would be a much different one than, than if it was a baptized person. Um, because you're still dealing with someone who's, I, I think it's, is it called the Pauline privilege? when you're married to a non-believer, because Paul talks about allowing people who are married to non-believers to separate if the non-believer wants to be the one to separate, not the believer. Um, I, don't, I know that's canon law. I don't know how it's specified in the actual, like what you actually have to require for that. But that deals with a, a believer married to a baptized person married to a non-baptized uh, person. Yeah, I'm not a marriage uh, canon lawyer, so <laughs> that stuff. I don't want to be either. Um, some rules that still apply that will come up that you'll uh, mention. In these mixed marriages, the Catholic party will be asked to affirm um, that he or she is prepared to avoid the dangers of abandoning the faith themselves and to promise sincerely to do all in his or her power to see the children of the marriage are baptized and educated in the Catholic faith and the other partners to be informed of these responsibilities. So um, if that doesn't happen, though, the church says this it, on page 29, the, the indented paragraph. If notwithstanding the Catholic's best efforts, notice it presupposes good faith on the Catholic's part to actually have tried to see that this really occurred. If the children are not baptized and brought up in the Catholic church, the Catholic parent does not fall subject to the censure of canon law. Um, you don't get any of the penalties associated with having failed in your oath. At the same time, his or her obligation to share the Catholic faith with the children does not cease. So the exact norms differ. Um, each, the Synod of Bishops, there's a set for the entire United States that the USCCB has on how that, what the wording is that when the Catholic partner and the non-Catholic partner are informed of the Catholic partner's requirement. Um, again, that's a lot of that. It's, it's it's stuff we don't have to get too much into. Now, some of the rules on page 30. The first two deal with marrying members of the Eastern Church, and then the other ones deal with marrying members of non-Eastern Christian communities. And so the norms for Catholics marrying um, Eastern churches is, number one, a marriage between a Catholic and a member of an Eastern Church is valid if it has taken place with a celebration of a religious rite by an ordained minister. Um, for lawfulness, the canonical form of celebration is to be observed. What that basically is saying is the Eastern churches and the Catholic churches, our norms and our requirements for marriage are generally the same. So that those marriages are per se valid, even if they're celebrated in an Eastern church, they would still be a legitimate 
sacramental marriage. Um, the only issue that could arise, and they don't address it here, and I don't want to get any more into it other than the very briefest thing is, the, Catholic, the Eastern churches have different um, ways uh, they handle divorce and remarriage. That might be the only thing that could be a problem from the Catholic side um, because you might be marrying a divorced Eastern Christian who didn't have to go through any process like we understand it as annulment and therefore the, the Catholic bishop would have to look at that and see, well, where is that person you know, canonically vis-a-vis -vis that first marriage, something like that. That would be the only issue. That's why it mentions canonical form at the end. But otherwise, generally those are per se valid and they can take place in either church. You just inform the bishop and usually that's acceptable because those churches are, quote, historic uh, ordained uh, apostolic succession. Now, um, the second one just goes into to more detail about it. When it comes, however, to the Protestant churches, um, the norms are required in, in this case. It says canonical form is required for validity of marriages between Catholics and uh, Christians of churches of other ecclesial communities. And notice, a Eucharistic sharing ordinarily is not allowed to occur in a wedding. Now it can, and that one is up to the pastor. If the couple asks and, and they want it, the pastor says, yes, you can have a mass with this. But the pastor is to, let, is to kind of look at the situation. Like, is, is the bride, for example, is her entire family not Catholic? Or is her family maybe a mix of a lot of Catholics and non-Catholics? I mean, is half the, it's half the wedding uh, participants not going to be going to communion? It's those kind of things that um, the priest should kind of, or the deacon, you need to look at, you know, when someone asks you that. And you know one of the partners is not Catholic, is, well, okay, will the mass look more like a sign of unity or will it look like a sign of disunity at this time when we're supposed to be showing your guys' connection of oneness uh, as a couple? So... Um, it's, it is allowed, but it is suggested that it not occur, but after explanation and such, the, the person can decide whether to do so or not. Um, notice, though, the church is very clear. If you go down the same number two there, it says, The norm stated above concerning the admission of a non-Catholic Christian to Eucharist communion, as well as those concerning the participation of a Catholic in a Eucharistic communion in another church, must be observed. That is, no, just because it's a wedding, we don't suddenly get to give communion to non-Catholics. And just because you're a, a bridesmaid or a best man or a groomsman in a non-Catholic wedding, which you may be, you may not take communion if it's a Protestant church. So those norms are, are absolute. We don't suddenly change our uh, rules just because we're now at a marriage situation. Um, other things, just be aware Sometimes other churches have similar rules. In other words, they might be marrying in a, to a church that also says you have to be married according to our strictures and our rules. Um, the Catholic Church just says that is not a motive for dispensation for the Catholic. That will go into consideration by the bishop, but it's not a determinative factor if the other church has rules as well. And this one's important, though, to let people know and for yourself. Even if a wedding is celebrated that has been dispensed by the bishop from canonical form, even if it has been dispensed, there must be some public form of celebration for it to be valid. No secret marriages, right? You have to publicly make those vows, and the Catholic still has to state in some way the vows that would be his or hers as a Catholic about the openness to life, the marriage is lifelong commitment, things like that, in some form. So it may not go according exactly to the, the Catholic understanding, but it has to be, um, you know, according to that. And it has to still touch on the same stuff. Ah, oh, and we're already through. Sorry, guys. Well, we're already a little past, but while we have this last opportunity, and everybody, I think, turned in your stuff, right? Most of, most of almost everyone... Uh, emailed it to me already, so 
Do I have everybody's homilies? And I think I do. I haven't looked at them all yet, but I've been downloading them all to look at. So, okay. Any last questions, you guys, before we say goodbye? Yes. Okay, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, a rabbi, yes. It sounds like a joke. It, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yes, it is allowed. Um, the Jewish faith of all the non-Christian faiths is its own special case. Uh, in fact, if you were to go to the website I've mentioned sometimes at the Vatican, and you know you go to the the uh, the magisterial or the curial offices, and one is the uh, the Council for Christian Unity, and then there's another council that deals with non-Christian religions. But if you click, interestingly enough, if you click on the Christian one, ecumenism, at the top where it has the band, it'll be Eastern churches, Western Christians, and then it'll have its own tab for Judaism. Judaism is its own entity because we come from Judaism. The, the, the God of Israel is the God of Jesus Christ. And so they're in a unique situation because they don't fall entirely under the non-Christian religion um, umbrella, while at the same time they're clearly not Christian. So without being specific, yes, we can, Jewish Catholic weddings occur actually fairly frequently. They're probably the most frequent in this country for Catholics marrying non-Christians. Non, uh, but um, uh, so it can be done, but it's, that's a whole other issue of what has to be done in that case. Yeah, It still wouldn't be a sacramental marriage, though, because they still are not quote, Christian. So. And yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, chances are they were baptized somewhere, and so as far as, and I mean, it, it would depend. Like, do they actually attend church? A lot of those people are the same that are. Um, uh, SNBR, spiritual but not religious, um, whatever that means. Actually, I'll tell you what it means, uh, not, not to be callous to them, but basically spiritual but not religious means I get to make it up as I go along, right? Because spirituality is, is the lived expression of our religion, but if I don't have religion is what actually gives me the rules, the guidelines, the understanding that I'm living by, Otherwise, it's all just what I want it to be, and so there's no grounding. Now, some people legitimately are there because they never had any background and they don't know how to get there yet. Others are just flaky, let's be honest, and they just don't want to commit to anything. Um, so they use that as kind of their, you know, then you can't pick on them. They're like, well, I'm still searching, you know. Um, so it, it, it would, it, yeah, it, de it depends. Um, I would just classify them in general then, if, unless you have a specific, you know, baptism or background or church they attend. I would just classify them in general as kind of evangelical in general, at least, because they're not connected to any, you know, detailed religious faith. Um, yeah, from the Catholic standpoint, you can't truly be spiritual about religious in the true sense. Faith is both. Um, when the catechism defines faith, it says faith is first of all and primarily a personal adherence of the person to God. So that's spirituality. It's the subjective devotion, love, loyalty to the Lord. Then it says, and right, inseparably to all that the church has revealed, right? That, that, that God has revealed. And so that's the objective religion part. Both go together. Um, and both, if you, if, if you only have one and not the other, both are equally bad. I mean, there's a lot of people who have religion but no spirituality. And religion's more of a duty and stuff. And the only reason that they hang on at all is either to please their family or just some kind of cultural thing that's left over, but there's no real heart to it. Well, that's terrible too. But the other one's just as bad. It's more common maybe in our society now of 
well, I'm, relig I'm spiritual, but I don't belong to any group because all those sort of, with the idea of being all, all, any type of organized religion must stifle real faith and, and life. Um, it, it's sad, but that's one of the overall um, uh, manifestations of what Protestantism began. Because even though the first Protestant churches were organized churches and still remain so, they would be considered organized religion today. It, it's really that idea all of a sudden that it's just sort of me and God. I interpret the Bible for myself. I interpret this. And, and as the centuries go on, it, it kind of just devolves into something more of just whatever I feel. Um, I can't tell you the number of times where I'll be doing spiritual direction or someone will come in to talk to me and something will come up that they don't like about the faith or a Bible story, and they'll say, they'll say, it's always the same words. It's like they went to a class together. They'll be like, well, my God would never do that. And I never say the snarky thing in my mind, which is, well, that's because your God is made up, right? Your God wouldn't do any of these things because it's not the God of the Bible or the God that Jesus Christ revealed to us. But, yeah, I mean, that's just a, that's a whole other issue that we live with in our lives um, for that. In that, you know, you just try to bring those people to some kind of realization that um, if, they're, if they make any kind of statement that they're still Christian, like the one you commented, not all the spiritual but not religious people are even Christian, but the Christian ones, you know, if you can, and it always requires discernment, it's important to try to help them see that you kind of need both. In other words, <laughs> The Christ who you love is the person who founded the church that I, where I'm a part of. Right? It's, it's not separate. You can't separate the person from what he did in his actions. Everything Jesus did was connected to a community of people. He's the basis for the sacraments we celebrate. He's, you know, although we've added all the like human elements of you know, philosophy and everything else to it, the basic thing is you can't have one without the other. Uh, Peter Kreft calls it the decapitated Christ. I want Christ the head, but I don't like his body. <laughs> right? Well, you can't have that. Christ himself doesn't give you that option. He's the one who founded the very church that he says is his body. And so to be with him is to be in union with that body somehow. Uh, and of course we understand why, because the we, the body, aren't anything like Christ in the sense of we're failures at it. We do bad. Sometimes we're great sinners. Um, but nevertheless, it's in the messiness of that stuff that God does what he does. Um, and, you know, similarly with the whole idea of obedience, you know, maybe shown the passages where Jesus defines loving him by what? If you do what he says. That's not our understanding of love. In, in the modern West, we tend to make it very sentimental. I love Jesus. And so because I love Jesus, then that's what God's love is like. And therefore, everything's sort of permitted. And no matter what you do, God's going to forgive you. Whether you are s sorry for it or not, or repent or not, is irrelevant. And we really find ourselves very far away by letting kind of these real pagan or weird ideas into Christianity. So, uh, anyway, soapbox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And, and yeah, there's a discrepancy in the sense that it's at the high level where everything gets ultimately done, right? And if we ever do enter into a real communion with some of these churches, it's obviously going to happen at the high universal church level. However, ironically, 
it's at the diocesan, if not really the parish level, where, like you said, this is where it really, 90% of it occurs, where it's happening with people. One of the things I didn't mention, it was in the reading and stuff, but um, when, when we were going through, is the Diocese of San Diego has this requirement, or it's not a requirement, it's a strong suggestion. Uh, I can't find it right now, but it's also in the very first pages of the Blue Guidelines book, is that parish ecumenical representative. At one point, point about a decade ago, most churches had one of those people who would meet every few months with us, the big council, and they would discuss things, and then they would plan things for their own individual parishes, either with another neighboring non-Catholic Christian community or just stuff they were offering their parishioners, like to understand other faiths and how these things act. And I don't know why. I don't know, you know, as, as priests become more and more swamped, as there's fewer of them, they have not as much uh, time. I don't know if that just fell away or what happened, but um, it's not even, no one has one. Like, there's literally not one that I'm aware of anymore. And so, in some sense, yeah, the diocese, we need to do better work of um, helping prepare the parishes, putting on more um, functions that are actual more dialogue or more understanding, not just the prayer services at the level. Um, so that, so yeah, the average Catholic in the pew becomes more aware of these things and knows them. Because as you learn them, you learn your own faith more as well. Um, and you can respect the other churches and understand them now and be in a more better position to, to um, interact with people and friends and neighbors and parishioners even who might be other faiths. Um, but at the same time, you usually come to a better understanding of your own faith and why do Catholics do what we do and, and where does that come from and why and, and, and understand that better. So, yeah, I, I agree. It's something that we need to look at as a, as a whole diocese and, and really um, sort of focus on again. But, I mean, we could say that in a broader term too, though, right? I mean, uh, I don't want this to sound bad, but I, I mean, I've been in ministry almost 26, seven years now. And the indifference and lackadaisical faith of so many Catholics is really an issue we just have to deal with in general, like, let alone. I mean, and those are the ones who come to Mass, right? Um, not even mentioning the ones who barely show up, maybe twice a year, if that, but still, for whatever reason, consider themselves or call themselves Catholic. Um, there is a real need to really, and, and, and you know, part of the issue I think is, is um, um, we need to really deal with the adults more. We, we still try to do all this, you know, we have all the kid things, we have all CCD, and that's all great. I'm not saying we don't do that, but it, there really is a, a disjunction that once we hit a certain age as Catholics, unless you voluntarily choose to go to Catholic colleges and schools, and do, there's not a lot often there you know as much and so uh, there's just a lot of restructuring I think as a whole faith we kind of need to look at in this coming millennium um, I've always you know you look at a lot of the evangelical churches and their youth groups and stuff are alive and on fire and part of the reason it's not the only reason but part of the reason is it doesn't use a school model right most of us as Catholics still to this day the kids are in school Maybe not now with COVID, but they're in school six hours, and then what happens? They come to class, and they sit in another class. It looks just like their other classes, except the topic's religion for another hour, hour and a half. And so it's not really, you know, we're not necessarily giving them the opportunities to really experience the Lord and experience Jesus as much as we could in a lot of ways. But anyway, I'm keeping you too long, so let's do our closing prayer. And if you guys still want to ask questions or talk, I don't mind staying and hanging out, but... For anyone who wants to go, I don't want to make them feel pressured to sit, there, sit here. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you know all of the trials and tribulations of our diocese and just of the church throughout the world, Lord. And as always, we are struggling to live in this fallen world, struggling against our own desires of the flesh, and even against the actions and the uh, temptations of the evil one. But we know, Lord that stronger in us is you, far stronger than the one who dwells in the world. And so we ask you, Lord, to continue to help us in our ministry, help to bring that fire 
of love for you through your son Jesus Christ to each and every Catholic, Lord. Help us learn to be people of inspiration for them. Help us to be real models of our own faith, living it out with authenticity and with courage and generosity so that we can be a light to others to bring them into the deeper relationship with you, Lord, in the Catholic Church, and for those Christians outside the church to draw them into a deeper closeness with your Catholic faith, where maybe you will touch their hearts to also enter into larger communion and even be a witness to those outside of the Christian faith, Lord, of what the kingdom calls us to be and of God's special love and destiny for all the human race. Help us to accomplish these things, Lord. Help us always to rely on you, knowing by our own strength we cannot achieve these things. And we especially ask your special blessing of your spirit on each and every one of the couples here gathered in your name, watching via live stream or here live, Lord, as they move forward toward their um, ordination. We just ask that you would continue to empower them with your grace, to give them the courage the joy, the peace, the knowledge, and the security, and all the other gifts they need, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, it's been an honor to teach you guys. It's funny, on one hand, I'm sad I won't see you anymore. On the other hand, I'm glad I don't have to stay another night up really late. But I will miss you. You know, it's been five weeks, and I wish you all the best in your coming months until you get ordained. And, um, yeah, it's funny. Everyone who asks what I'm doing on Wednesday, I'll tell them, yeah, I'm teaching a diaconate class, and I've done this a lot in the past, but I say this, and I don't say this to all of them, I really don't, but uh, uh, from you guys who I've met, you guys are going to be a great group of deacons for our church, like all of you I think are really solid, good Catholic men, and your wives are awesome, so I'll miss you guys, but have a great time, and maybe we'll see each other again at some point. So, oh, and Quinn says you can go to the same page where I gave you my videos and watch my Bible study. <laughs> I do do them once a week, and there's years worth on there. So Does she make money videos? off of that? Is that what <laughs> she, she's trying to get me monetized, but you have to have so many views, it'll never happen. But, I don't know, 50 goes too. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the gift. I appreciate it. Yeah, so Thank you. And if you guys want to talk in here a little bit,